Hey, Tomalachi, it's been a while. I hope you're doing good. I had a fantastic 2021. Lots of things happened, good and bad. Uh, here we are back on, I'd say, a Tokyo show fight talks. Yeah, let's do a fight talks today. I had a series of questions from a Tomalachi up in Poland. So we're just going to attack them one by one. It's going to be a fairly long talk. So if you want to sit back and enjoy the ride, then go ahead and uh, get into your favorite chair or just uh, turn on those podcasts. Anyway, so how was your first Kyokushin Karate training ever? <clears throat> how did you get to the dojo? Interesting story. My first Karate training ever was in 1988, January 11th. I actually remember that day. Yeah. Um... And it was, uh, it was really cool. I had goosebumps when I saw everyone doing key eyes and stuff like that. And I found the dojo through a friend of my brother's called Michael. Uh, he had once been studying karate there. And um, yeah, he took me there and said, hey, you should check out this, doji, uh, this dojo um, because I used to train here. And you can have my old white belt and my old dogi. So I got the first dogi for free and inherited a white belt. And uh, yeah, after that, I was completely hooked. <clears throat> uh, question two. Uh, can you tell us something about the Ujideshi program, how it looked from the student side? If you guys want to hear more about the Ujideshi program, I have, uh, I think, 10 or 15 chapters on YouTube, which you free. You can check them out here on this channel. Um, it's all about the, um, the Blue-Eyed Samurai, uh, A Thousand Days of Training with Oyama Mastatsu. Uh, this is a book I wrote many years ago. It is on sale, only available if you are interested in a signed copy from me. You can make donations to the PayPal account that I have. Uh, I'll leave a description below if you're interested in that. I only have a couple of copies um, on a regular basis, so it's not a big seller. Um, and it's also fairly, uh, uh, yeah, hard to get because of uh, logistics with the travels now. Um, the inside of a Utsuyashi program is, I'm going to run that pretty shortly because I think if you want to go in-depth, you should uh, definitely check out the YouTube channel, uh, The blue Eyed Samurai, uh, Director's Cut. Um, it's three years, so you start as a first year Utsuyashi. Uh, mostly people are around 18 or 17 or 19 when they join. Uh, the Japanese used to get sent in there by their parents. Uh, but the foreign Uchideshi that came and went there, uh, we all wanted to do it because we thought it was a glorious program uh, to become like the best of the best in karate. Uh, it's very hard. Uh, it's a lot of hard work. You get up very early in the morning, like 5.30 to 6. We have morning training. Yeah, uh, morning training starts at 6 to 7. And then we have cleaning, uh, breakfast, the cleaning of the dojo inside. It is morning ceremony and we used to train uh, and also do lobby business. It was a, a full-time job uh, running around after your senpais and just making sure that all the chores were done and that the dojo was running smoothly. We also used to personally bodyguard Sosai uh, and take him to his house and make sure that he was always uh, protected. So that's kind of how that looks like. Um, yeah, my light just jumped out here. <laughs> Sorry, I'm gonna see if I can get that light back on. Yeah. Uh, next one. Uh, how it looks from the student side also. Uh, I would say that we were very privileged to have spending so much time with Sosai. Uh, we spent more time with Sosai than any other uh, student of Kyokushin. Uh, we were with him on the camps. We had special training with Sosai once a week, uh, a class only for allowed for Uchideshis. And then uh, we also trained with him in all the other classes that he taught. So Sosai used to teach, teach four classes a week. It was uh, Thursday for Uchideshis only, uh, Friday, mm, no, wait. Thursdays for Uchideshi only, and then Saturday for anyone who wanted to join. I think also in the beginning it was Friday night. Yeah, Friday night was Black Belt class from 7 o'clock, and then Saturday was from 1 o'clock, and then from 3.30 on Sunday afternoons. So those are the four days that Sosa used to teach, and uh, we were privileged enough to be in all his classes. Um, number three, what do you remember best of it, or at least, um, what was the best memory? Um, I just recorded the other day uh, the story about how I got my black belt. So I will tell this story briefly here um, and you will probably understand why that was probably one of the best things that ever happened to me. Uh, when I first came to Japan, I was actually a brown belt in Denmark, um, but 
I started over as a white belt. So I went from white to yellow and then from yellow to green. And about um, a month before the black belt test, there is a uh, another green, a test, which normally Uchideshis, they go up and then they become brown belts. So they, you become brown belt in one year, then you go as a brown belt for the second year, and then you get your black belt in the beginning of the third year, and then you start teaching classes and you finish off your Uchideshi program as a, as a Nidan. Uh, this is generally uh, speaking what happens in the Uchidesh program. But Sosai had told me when I first met him, you should go for your black belt in the first year. Go for the Nidan in the second year and third Dan uh, 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 as a graduate from Uchidesh and go back to your country. And I was like, wow, that's a great idea. Anyway, as a green belt, I thought this is going to be hard to go from green to brown to black within a month. Um, so I asked uh, Sosai for permission if it was okay that I could test for black belt. And he looks at me, he goes... <laughs> And that means, uh, he says, oh, that's a great request, but do you think you can do 20 man kumite? So Sosa had decided when I went there and asked him uh, if I wanted to do, if I could do a black belt, that the black belt test wasn't enough. So he wanted me to do for the, the Nidan, which was a 20 man kumite. Uh, and it was a fantastic experience. I stood there amongst all the, the other black belts from all over Japan. It was a three day test. Uh, it was one half day of, of kihon and basics and kata and stuff like that and jumping kicks and walking on our hands and then uh it was just two and a half days like from nine o'clock in the morning to eight o'clock at night of fighting there were so many people going for their fourth dance fifth dance and third dance and so i thought that um like the other brown belts or you know uh, lower belts you normally you do one fight and then they take it off and then so you're fighting every hour pretty much for the for two and a half days but so i called me up uh during the uh, the lunch break and said oh you're going to be the first one up for your Nijunin Kumite, for your 20-man Kumite, and uh, you're going to fight all fights in a row. And I was just like, oh my God, what have I gotten myself into? Anyway, I fought really well. I'd become really strong. I had arrived in Japan at 72 kilos. I was at the time, I think, 86 kilos. Um, so yeah, I was strong enough to do the 20-man Kumite. I didn't lose any other fights. Um, I knocked a couple of guys out with some back kicks and axe kicks and stuff like that. And then there was a big buzz about this new kid on the block, basically. Yeah, that was definitely the thing that I really remember the best the least thing about the Uchidesh program that I that I would like to not talk about is when I overslept one morning in Uchideshi uh, dormitory I think I was still a first year at the time and my senpai came in and kicked me in the head and told me to go outside and do a thousand jumping squats that was not fun uh, okay where are we how uh, Mastatsu was in private he was exactly in private as he was in public he was exactly like that the same character all the time super inspiring and super uh, friendly and just like also strict at the same time uh, but he just had this aura of the presence of a god we believed he was a god um yeah how did you get into the program did you get try to get in yourself did someone come up with the initiative what were the criteria and procedures so back in the day i didn't know that there was any i didn't even know he was alive uh we had a black and white photo in the dojo and uh, he basically uh, was a legend. So one day after training for about two years in Denmark, one of my senpai came up to me and said, hey, you're training like those Uchidesh in Japan. You're always here at the dojo. And I was like, excuse me, what's that? And he goes, yeah, you know, Oyamastatsu is still teaching these uh, crazy guys that do uh, karate from morning to night. I was just like, what? He's still alive? And I was like, I have to do that. Uh, there was absolutely no information to be gotten at that time. So I asked my sensei in Denmark, Shihan Boots, and I said, look, I'd like to try this Uchideshi program. He just laughed at me and said, there's no way you're good enough or strong enough for this. No way. And so I said, no, no, I really want to do it. I went home, I convinced my mother, and then she gave me permission. And I went back to sensei like a week after and I said, no, I'm actually serious. I want to do this Uchideshi program. And he's like, well, I'm going to give you a three month period where I have to check and see if you're actually serious enough and you come and do all your training sessions. That was for me the easiest test ever because I was already there more than anyone else. I was training every day, doing self-training, weight training, running in the park, doing the classes. Uh, yeah, everything I could find out to do. I was always there every day. So three months pass and then he says, well, if your mother is okay with this, we can write a recommendation letter. So I went home, wrote a letter um, asking Sosai for acceptance as a Nuchidishi and I got a recommendation letter from Shihan Boots. We sent those two letters ahead and on the day of the summer camp, uh, which in Denmark is in June, uh, the letter from Japan arrived telling me that I could come and start as a Nuchideshi the following year. So that was a, a quite experience. Yeah, I was very excited. And that year, uh, Sensei Michael Thompson was teaching on the camp and it was absolutely the most phenomenal camp I've ever done in my life. Um, did you have as a European a problem to get the program or the Japan 
or to the Japan organization of the trip difficulties. Uh, yes, there was a very difficult to get visa because it was a three-year program and they only give you one year for cultural activities. Uh, I had a recommendation letter from Solsai uh, signed that I took to the embassy in Denmark and they said, yeah, we can give you one year, uh, but you need to show us uh, how much money you have in the bank. And I didn't have a lot of money, so my mom had to uh, support me through that and uh, without her I would not have ever gone to Japan and finished the program. So may she rest in peace and thank you for your help and support, mom. Um, visa situations in Japan, if anyone's ever interested in coming to Japan and training and staying for a long time, is not as easy as it seems, uh, especially now with COVID and everything. And also living expenses is considered very high, probably one of the highest in the world. Um, so it is not impossible to live cheaply as a share house or something like that, but you should definitely look into um, yeah, different websites and do some research online before you do these things. I don't think they have anyone now who actually offers a proper Uchideshi program anymore. This was very specific to Sosa. Um, the other dojos that I know of that have done Uchideshi programs, they're not like the Uchideshi program we were living at the dojo and everything. This normally where they would live in their own apartments and they just come and train and take care of the dojo. It was basically uh, yeah, someone who loves karate and doesn't want to do anything else. Um, during the... Uh, oh, here we are. Um... What was the atmosphere between Uchideshi support and or competition? I'm not quite sure what the question means here, but I think I get it. So the atmosphere between Uchideshi as in uh, the same year Uchideshi was very, right, brothership, brotherhood. If you're a one above or you're one below, it's like senpai kohai, very strict. Uh, you kind of get along, but you don't because it's always like you're just doing os, os, os to everything. So the rivalry in that sense is not really rivalry, it's just senpai kohai. And the senpai are always taking advantage of that situation and um, sometimes it's not so nice. Uh, competition is like completely different, right? Because you're fighting against someone else from other dojos and stuff like that. So that's just competition. I mean, fighting is fighting. Uh, what special uh, situations did you remember while studying with Mastatsu Oyama? Well, obviously, uh, the main thing was that we had the special Uchijashi class every Thursday from 1 o'clock to 2.30. It was an hour and a half. We didn't do the Kihon. We started off with 50 punches and 50 mashigiris, and then we went straight to Ido Geiko or Kata. Uh, it was a very special class because Sosai would uh, do weight training in the back and have us do Maikiagis for like 30 minutes at a time, or he'd sit up on the, on the Shinden and just look at us and we'll do a Kata, and it was like, Us! And he goes, Muikai, Muikai. <laughs> and that just means like, do it again, do it again, do it again. So he made us do um, uh, thousands of repetitions and endless repetitions of everything. And we did them uh, perfectly well, but it was just like that, that brutal um, yeah, training and attitude. And we wanted to do better, even though um, we just done it like, you know, 50 or 100 times already. Um, and then... I remember during the summer times, it gets so hot in Japan that people are like sometimes passing out. So sometimes the, the, the weaker Uchideshi or the weaker students in the classes, we like pull them to the side, put some water on their face, and then Sosai just kept the, the training going. So it was pretty hardcore back in those days, no air conditioner. Yeah. Um, during thousand days of Uchideshi program, did you have moments of doubt? Were there moments when you wanted to stop training? Uh, yes. Once, <laughs> I had a broken toe, I think I was like two months in uh, and I broke my first toe. So I couldn't work out in the dojo and I was walking around on crutches and it was really painful. And then there was this other guy from Australia who uh, was really teasing me and teasing uh, other people and like he got into a lot of trouble. And I just, I didn't feel like I could stand up for myself because I had a broken toe and I didn't want to, uh, I didn't want to be there at a one night. So I went down into the dojo uh, basement uh, and my senpai was like, I remember Suzuki senpai in the, in the lobby because we used to sleep in the lobby uh, and also in the dorms. So there was someone always protecting Hombu 24-7. Um, and I went I went there and it was in the middle of the night thing. It was like 10 o'clock or something. And he's like, yeah, Suzuki was like, what are you doing? I was like, oh, I just need to, some time for myself. He's like, ah, okay. Yeah, yeah, you can go down there. And I stood there on my crutches and hit the bag with my punches until I like hit it out of myself. And then I went upstairs and then Suzuki Senpai was like, you know what, you can sleep over here with us tonight. There's only two Uchideshi sleeping in the front desk, so yeah. And I felt really um, like, I don't know, uh, brotherhood ship somehow. It was very, uh, it was very uh, emotional. But it was only at one time. Uh, every, ever, the rest of the, the three years, I was like, literally, I loved being Uchideshi. I loved training. I loved doing it. Uh, how has karate changed over the years? Was it better or was it worse? Hmm... 
It's a good question. Uh, I think everything is always changing. I think the fighting is always slightly changing, but at the end of it, it's also basically the same. I think that the fighters in the fourth world tournament, fifth world tournament, sixth, seventh, eighth world tournament, I think they're all great fighters. They all have their own eras of, uh, of greatness. And I think that um, if you put them all together in one tournament uh, <laughs> to see who was the strongest out of all of them, I think that uh, generally speaking, because it's the same rules, that um, yeah, you'll find that whoever was the better on the day would be the better. Uh, I think that all the champions would have a chance to, to prove themselves for sure. Um, I would like to have been considering myself as one of the top of those guys, but um, that is for you guys to judge. So, what fight in K1 you remember the most and why? I think it was the turning point in my career in K1 where I fought um, Jerome LeBanner because it was the first time that I really stood up to a monster uh, in the ring in front of 35,000 people and, and, and figured out that, oh, I can, I can actually have a chance in this ring. Uh, it was the most scary thing I've ever done. He was absolutely a beast and a monster and he taught me a very big, important lesson on the day and uh, I'm forever grateful for it. If you're interested in hearing my commentating on that fight, you can also look on it, uh, look for it here on the Tokyo Show. Just go through the uh, vlogs and look for uh, Nicholas Pettis versus uh, Jerome LeBanner. Yes, that's a great fight actually. Of course, obviously the best fight ever was the, against, the one against Musashi where I won the Japan Grand Prix champion in 2001. Uh, how did it happen that you get to the big screen? <laughs> was it an interesting experience or which movie was the best? Okay, let's be honest here, brutal honesty. I've been on the big screen in a couple of movies, Japanese movie productions, so it was like fairly low budget. I would not exactly call myself a, a successful actor or anything. But I, uh, as a child, I always wanted to do acting. Uh, I just never got into it because I started karate at 14 and then it was all about, about karate. So I never really... Um, uh, explored the uh, acting uh, world in that way. How do you go through acting training or anything? Uh, but by becoming famous in Japan, I was lucky enough to get opportunities into actual Japanese movies and uh, mostly drama. Now, the biggest experience in this was probably a, uh, a, a movie by Beat Takeshi, which is uh, uh, Kitano Takeshi, which is a very famous uh, comedian and also movie director in Japan. He's made some fantastic Yakuza movies and, and different things. Um, and he directed uh, a re-enactment uh, of a true story of uh, some Japanese uh, priests back in the 40s or 50s, I think it was, uh, that had uh, killed a Japanese girl and they covered it up by pretending to be all holy. And I actually pretended, uh, not pretended, I played the uh, the acting priest um, that was protecting the church and everything. And so I had a scene where uh, B. Takeshi comes in and he's like, you know, pressuring me with questions and stuff like that. And uh, it was just uh, an honor to be able to do that. Uh, but yeah, uh, acting is really cool. If there was such a thing as a foreign actor that could be successful, I was probably the one that was fairly successful with it for a while. But unfortunately in Japan... Um, they would prefer to see Japanese actors and then the foreign roles are always just like whoever's there they'll use. Um, so yeah, that really never really took off, unfortunately. Um, why did you switch from full contact karate to K1 organization? Why did I switch? Uh, K1 organization, let's just clarify that. K1 uh, Fighting uh, Entertainment Group is a company uh, that has a tournament called the K1. So it's not really, it wasn't an organization at the time when I was doing it. Um, now they have uh, actually official K1 gyms and uh, K1 HQ and stuff like that. Um, I also started doing the K1 fight uh, co English commentating uh, since last year. So if you see some of the latest fights with the K1 on the English commentary on YouTube, you could uh, hear my voice with uh, Russell. And it's kind of interesting to do that actually. Get back in there and watch it a lot. Why did I switch? Well, at the time I was burnt out of karate. I had fought Okamoto Toru in the 26th All Japan Tournament. And my heart for staying in Japan and living and training under those conditions while being treated so unfairly uh, in tournament fighting was gone. And um, I was about to move uh, out of Japan and go to Australia and help set up a new dojo uh, in Melbourne. I was very interested in doing this because it was thought it would be a fantastic opportunity for me. But uh, at the time when I asked to move, uh, K1 had given me an offer to fight professionally. And I took it because it was a lot of money and it seemed like very exciting times. I also started traveling the world, training in America, training in Europe. And uh, yeah, it was a very uh, exciting time in my life. Um, way more fun than karate. 
Uh, the only backdrop on that one was that if uh, they told me that if you choose to go to K1, uh, we will support you, uh, uh, but you are also uh, obliged to, which means you have to fight in the next upcoming world tournament. So that's why I went back and fought second time in a world tournament. Ended up placing fifth for the second time. So yeah, even with three years away from karate, I went back and trained for the karate world tournament and I got a fantastic result, I think. So no, no regrets there, except I should have kept my hands up so that Pichinov did not kick me in the head. <laughs> uh, which fights, uh, Kyokushin or K1, were bigger challenge for you? Uh, Francisco Filio was probably my, like my biggest uh, challenge back in the, uh, in the day because he was upcoming and I, I'd seen him uh, knock out Andy Hoog four years previously and now this year I was uh, up against him in the best eight. And so I really wanted to win that fight, but it was just, yeah, I don't know. It was just too emotional. <laughs> it's hard to say. Maybe one day I can have a fight talk about that one. Um, what do you think is the key to success? Uh, train smart, train hard, and find good training partners or coaches. Uh, people that think more volume is equal to better results are absolutely idiots. Um, keep it smart, keep it enough that you get the results that you're looking for. Uh, divide your training into strength and conditioning, which are two different things, by the way. And then uh, there's actual skill training, and then there's what we would consider sparring, uh, which is the play sport. Um, if you do too much sparring, uh, you get lazy, and I don't like it, so spar less, but spar harder. Just put more protection on. How did you happen to start working in CrossFit and do you enjoy it? I don't work in CrossFit. Uh, it's also something we need to clarify. I own a CrossFit gym. Uh, so I became certified as a CrossFit coach and then was able to open up my own gym and it's actually really cool. Uh, I got invited by Reebok uh, because I have a famous name in Japan and they were looking for ambassadors for CrossFit all over the world and it's been now 10 years. Uh, we opened up eight years ago and the business is knock on wood still good. I'm still here. Uh, members are still coming in and being happy. I stepped off uh, teaching on the floor <clears throat> last year so now I focus on being an owner and trying to uh, expand the business which is good CrossFit can be really good for um, karate fighters also <clears throat> K1 is a very prestigious organization in Japan what has changed in your life after joining this organization oh everything everything changed um, fortune and fame <laughs> rise of Nicholas Pettis and fall of Nicholas Pettis and reinventing myself it's it's all part of that whole journey yeah after injuries in K1 tournaments, have you thought about ending your career? Uh, no, not from injuries. Uh, uh, so let's talk about the injuries I've sustained in the K1 specifically. Um, a shoo, it started with a broken leg. <laughs> uh, uh, no, it was a broken nose first, then a broken leg, then a broken arm. And uh, yeah, those are just broken bones. Those you can come back from. Uh, but the thing that made me want to pull out of K1 or actual professional fighting was around 36 years old. I had my first hip replaced and I just knew that it would be too excruciating to go through rehab and actually fight with the risk of never being able to walk again with a fully replaced hip. Uh, now I have two replaced hips. So I've got two titanium hips inside. And... Through CrossFit, actually, which is interesting, I found out that I can do just about anything except run long distance. Um, so if I'm smart about my training, I can still uh, enjoy lifting and, and pushing and, and doing whatever I like to, um, which is kind of interesting, actually. Um, yeah, just I don't like running very far. It just it makes my left hip, only the left one, uh, sore, and uh, I just don't like it. Um, you are called a blue-eyed samurai. Uh, what does that mean for you? Mm, I think it's a very uh, uh, big title to, to have been given. Um, I think I was officially the first uh, foreign fighter in Japan to be called that. Uh, it was way back in 1993, I think, in a Power Karate or a World Karate magazine where they called me the Blue-Eyed Samurai. And then that got kind of kicked up. Andy Hoog was called the Blue-Eyed Samurai for a while, but he actually, they, they named him something different. They called him a Tatsujin, which is like the master uh, of, of K1 uh, after that, which he was more known for. Um, there was a lot of controversy overseas because of uh, diehard K1, fan, uh, not K, yeah, K1 fans from Andy Hoog, where they're like, ah, you're not the, you're not the Blue-Eyed Samurai. And I've had this conversation so many times, um, and I think it's retarded because uh, Josh Barnett also in Pride was called the Blue-Eyed Samurai. Uh, the, the phrase of the Blue-Eyed Samurai, we also have baseball players who are being called the Blue-Eyed Samurais. 
uh, it is a way for the Japanese to say, wow, he's like one of our own. We really respect him for his fighting spirit and also for demonstrating his love for Japan. And I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Uh, I take that name to myself with great pride. Um, I've worn it for many, many years and decades. And no matter where I go in Japan, uh, people go, they look at me and sometimes they remember me as the Blue-Eyed Samurai before they remember my name. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, <clears throat> no, no shame in that. <clears throat> um, do you practice meditation? If so, what kind of? So I go to bed every night and I play meditation music and I consider myself meditating for eight or nine hours every night. <laughs> you could also call it sleeping. Uh, no, not so much more. Uh, but I used to do specific meditation training in uh, as part of my, my, my fight squad. Uh, we would always finish the class with uh, specific mindset um, uh, tapes. We would spend uh, 15 or 20 minutes uh, lying down after class where it's all fresh in your mind when you have a chance to... Uh, to really like reflect on what happened in the sparring sessions or reflect on what happened during the class that you just had. So we would um, turn off the light and turn on the, the specific uh, mindset uh, training music and uh, do that uh, four times a week. So it was Monday, Tuesday, fight squad, and Thursday, Friday. So that would happen four times a week. Yeah. Leading up to the world tournaments, I would also use mind tapes to specifically do, uh, what do you call it? Uh, mind, um, not meditation, but um, uh, visual training like inside your brain where you're like visualizing how you want to fight, how you want to be uh, and react to different situations. And that actually helped me a lot uh, since I didn't have an actual physical coach training me and teaching me how to fight uh, before the world tournaments. Um, what would be your message to the karate students in Poland? Do you have any advice for us? I've uh, taught on two camps in Poland, had the great pleasure of being over there and uh, actually training with you guys. So, uh, all I can say is I think you're doing a great job. Uh, as long as you love what you're doing and you continue it, then I'm sure you're going to get great results. Um, people always ask me, what is the shortcut to, to becoming a champion? How do we get to the top of the mountain? And uh, brutal honesty, it's hard work, it's talent, and then it's good training partners. Um, but if I had to give you any uh, piece of advice to get um, stronger and better, it would be um, wear more protective gear. Uh, put double shin pads on if you have to, uh, wear gloves, uh, whatever it takes for you to be able to fight as hard as you can, but fight to knock out, so for real, fight to knock out. And then when you, when you spar to, to, to knock out people, you'll see that getting into the tournaments, you'll have much more confidence in what you're doing. You can build strategies and plans for each fight that you have. This is also something I recommend. Um, do the visual training uh, with the tapes, do the meditation if that's what it takes. But um, seriously, take a notepad, write down your strength and weaknesses, and then map out how you get better at what you're bad at and how you get better at what you're good at. So, good luck, guys. This was Nicholas Pettis, the Blue-Eyed Samurai, all the way from Japan. Os.